It's a real privilege to be with you here at the Mental Health Summit of the North American Division. My topic this morning is how to keep from losing your mind or developing the mind of Christ. As we get into that topic, let's bow our heads to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts for these minds of ours, minds that can reflect the image of Jesus. We want to guard our thoughts in a world that's losing their mind to material values, to secularism, to discouragement, despair, and depression, to Satan's temptations. We pray that you'd help us to guard our minds and keep our minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The human brain is an infinite engineering intelligence. The average person has about 48 thoughts a minute, according to the neuroimaging lab at the University of Southern California. Now that adds up to a total of 70,000 thoughts a day and a whopping 25,550,000 thoughts a year. Now that's pretty staggering, isn't it? The average human brain weighs about three pounds and continues to develop until a person is approximately 18 years old. Human brains contain 100 billion brain cells, and these brain cells are the longest living cells in the body. They can actually live as long as the human being lives. Now, the thoughts of the brain are powered by something called neurotransmitters, and they're in turn powered by copious amounts of blood. So the red blood cells are the oxygen-carrying cells to the human brain and to the body. And the more oxygen we have to the brain, the clearer our thought patterns are. The interesting thing about this is that without oxygenated blood, a person can live probably four to six minutes at, at most, and a person will lose consciousness after 10 seconds. Can you believe it? After 10 seconds without oxygenated blood. Now, these neurotransmitters that fire in the brain develop, and they are similar to waterways or channels. It's a very simplistic way to put it. I recognize that. But when water runs down a particular channel, it deepens that channel. So as these neurotransmitters fire in the brain, they develop brain patterns. And as these brain patterns develop as the result of the electrical impulses that fire repeated messages down this pathway in our brains, the more we think a certain thought, the deeper the pathway becomes. And so picture this, neurotransmitters creating electrical impulses in the brain. And the more you think negative thoughts, the deeper that channel, if you use the illustration of waterway, becomes. The more you think positive thoughts, the more that pathway to the brain connects with those brain cells to develop positive pathways. Now here is a vital truth that affects our thinking. You ready for it? Here it is. The human mind is so constructed that it will always set itself on something. And it's a law of life. If we think about something long enough, the thing we think about long enough is what we become. Our thoughts will literally be in a groove. And once our thoughts are locked in that groove, our attitudes and our actions follow. It's of paramount importance that we guard our minds. Now, I'd like to take you back, back 2,000 years to a dark, damp, dingy dungeon. The Apostle Paul is in Rome. He's older now. His hand is shaking. There are deep etched lines upon his face. His hair has grayed. The old warrior of the cross has experienced shipwreck, beaten with rods, stoning. The old warrior of the cross is now weary. His body aches with pain. But yet he writes to the church at Philippi, those magnificent words, the book of Philippians is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of joy in the midst of trial and difficulty. 
Paul's thoughts did not turn to negative pathways. The neurotransmitters of his brain did not go down the pathway of depressed thinking. Paul, in the book of Philippians, 28 or more times talks about rejoicing or rejoice. In Philippians 4, verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. He's in prison. He's separated from family and friends, so easy to get discouraged or depressed. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The words of rejoicing are mentioned again and again and again throughout the book of Philippians. Paul's positive frame of mind is also introduced earlier in the book of Acts. You recall Paul was, the first time he was in Philippi, he was preaching. And as he preached in the city, he angered many of the citizens. He was thrown in prison, into that dark prison before he was thrown there. He was beaten, the Bible says placed in stocks, that is, his hands and feet were manacled, or they were placed in these wooden entrapments. And here Paul and Silas are in prison. And what do we read about them in Acts, the 16th chapter? What was their mental frame of mind? What were they thinking when they were there in prison? Did did they think, this is just not fair? This never should have happened to me? Did they think negative thoughts? God, why did you ever allow this to happen? God, we were serving you. God, this is unfair. What were Paul and Silas thinking? Acts 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Here, Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're not in any way depressed or discouraged. Why not? Because they believe that God is greater than their challenges. God's bigger than their difficulties. God's larger than whatever they have to face. Paul's positive frame of mind echoes and re-echoes throughout his epistles. Now the question needs to be asked, how do you rejoice when you're in prison? How do you rejoice when your body's racked with pain? How do you rejoice when you're separated from those that you love? How can you resist negative, melancholy, depressing thoughts when facing a crisis? Now, there's a short, powerful message from Paul that comes like an arrow from the Lord's quiver and pierces our hearts. Philippians chapter 2. How can you rejoice in times of difficulty? How can you keep from losing your mind in times of trial? Now notice Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul's in prison and he says, let this mind be in you. The word let means allow or permit. In other words, if we surrender our minds to Christ and allow him to shape our thoughts, Jesus will transform our thinking. Now remember, if you think something long enough, it's going to impact your action and your attitudes. Now in this presentation, I'm going to share with you a few basic biblical principles of how to keep your mind when the world's losing their mind. How to refrain from negative, unhealthy attitudes and depressive, depressing feelings. Now these eternal principles are going to make a major difference in your life. Here's the principle number one. Our focus shapes our thoughts. Can you say that with me? You got it. Our our what? Our focus shapes our thoughts. Our thoughts are not developed in a vacuum. They're developed based on internal factors, some of which are genetic, and external stimuli. But those internal factors and those external stimuli, that is to say what's going on inside our heads, and what's going on around us, those factors are not as great as what's going on above us. It's not what's within us, or not what's around us, but it's what a focus on what's above us, what's beyond us, that keeps us sane in an insane world. Now these thoughts that we think 
are firmly fixed in the grooves of our brain as we focus on them. They become indelibly written in our mental or moral constitution. We become like what we think about most. This is why the Apostle, Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3, the Paul urges us, encourages us how to have positive thought patterns. This is what he says. Colossians 3, verse 1, 2. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things that are above. Seek the things where? Above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. Set your mind, the Bible says, on things above. Notice the two words, seek and set. If you want to change your thought patterns, make a conscious choice to seek the things of eternity. Make a conscious choice to set your mind on things above. Now Paul emphasizes this point again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where he says, by beholding, you know it, don't you? By beholding, we become what? Changed. So that's the principle. We become like that which we most admire. We become like that where we set our thought patterns on. If our thought patterns are on the majesty of God, the greatness of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, we may be going through challenges. We may be going through some difficulties. But our minds are lifted above the problem to the God who is greater than the problem and who can provide solutions to the problem. So our minds are not fixed upon the problem. Our minds are not stayed upon the problem. Our minds are stayed upon God. Ellen White adds this remarkable statement in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 597, which she says, it is a law of the mind. It is a what? law of the mind. There are certain laws, the law of gravity, the law of inertia, certain scientific laws. It's a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it's trained to dwell. If occupied with commonplace matters only, it'll become dwarfed and enfeebled. If never required to grapple with difficult problems, it will, after a time, almost lose the power of growth. In the word of God, the mind finds subject for the deepest thought and the loftiest aspiration. So it's a law of the mind that it's going to adapt itself on the subjects it's allowed to dwell. If you dwell on your problems, your mind's going to be filled with problems. If you dwell on your difficulties, your mind's going to be filled with difficulties. If you dwell on what's negative about other people, you're going to see negative in other people. But if you focus your mind, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. If you focus your mind on Jesus... If you fill your mind with the faith-building stories of the word of God, if you fill your mind with the miracles of Christ, if you fill your mind with the grace and forgiveness of Christ, you then will see the majesty of the Spirit of God through Jesus working in your heart and in your life. If you want to change your thoughts, change your focus. Repeated actions become ingrained thoughts. Now here's the second vital principle, the first vital principle of having healthy mental mind, healthy thoughts. The first principle is focus your mind on the things of eternity. Now here's the second one. Don't accept every thought that passes through your mind as true. Merely because you think something doesn't make what you think Reality. Don't accept every thought that passes through your mind as true. Now the Bible is clear. Simply because we think about negative thoughts about ourselves, others or circumstances, what we are facing, what we're thinking doesn't make those thoughts a reality. Again, we discover something wonderful, some amazing counsel in this book of rejoicing. What's the book of rejoicing? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Here it is. We discover something amazing here. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord reveals to us a divine plan of mental health. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for what? Nothing. 
What does being anxious mean? Be worried, tense, fearful. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard or keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, there are four things about that text that are important. Number one, we can keep our minds when the world is losing their mind. Secondly, we can have peace when we don't understand. Now, that's a key point. There are times that people say to me, why did this happen to me? I just don't understand it. And they're all tense and upset. When you know God, you don't have to understand everything. When I don't understand with my head, I can still believe with my heart. When I cannot figure it out in my mind, I can still have peace in my soul. Because there is a peace that passes, what? Understanding. Thirdly, we'll keep our minds not by being consumed by worry, fear, and anxiety, but by focusing on something different than either our own frailties, weaknesses, or circumstances. Through prayer, we'll discover the power of God to change our thought patterns from worry about ourselves to the wonder about the goodness of God. And here's the fourth thing about our text. Prayer becomes the channel for the blessings of God to flow into our lives and eradicate us from being, eradicate the stranglehold of worry, fear, and anxiety. So as we pray and seek God, peace replaces worry. Hope replaces fear. Joy replaces sorrow. So merely because I think something, merely because I'm worried about circumstances, merely because I'm fearful about what may happen in the future, merely because I'm tensed up about something in my own life, does not mean that that is reality. I can be living in a false world. The world of eternity is a big world. God is a big God. I remember J.B. Phillips' book, Your God is Too Small. We serve a big God who can deliver us from those em stranglehold of those emotions. Now, the devil sometimes tempts us to focus on how bad we are and how horrible our circumstances are. Now, he can do that by focusing us on thoughts about ourselves, that we're not good enough, that we can never be saved. He can inflict upon us that negative thinking. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. When the devil attempts to say to you that you are not good enough, when the devil attempts to say to you that you can never be saved, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. What's, what's John saying here? He's saying simply this, don't believe the devil's deceptions. Don't believe every thought that floods into your mind. When the devil tells you you are a guilty sinner, tell him, Jesus is a mighty savior and you're a child of God. When the devil tells you you're too weak to overcome some cherished sin, tell him he's right. But Jesus is a mighty conqueror and in his name you'll be victorious. When the devil tells you that your family's falling apart and there's little hope, tell him that Jesus is a mighty healer and that in Christ there is hope. Don't listen to the devil's lies about yourself because the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. Merely because you think something doesn't make the something you think about necessarily true. Now this is true regarding our own thoughts about ourselves and regarding our own thoughts about others. Merely because you think something about somebody else doesn't mean what you think about them is true. Our perceptions of another are not always reality. You remember in 1 John chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, it says, hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's a spirit of truth and there's a spirit of error. The devil can try to introduce thoughts into our minds to divide us from other people by the perceptions of what we have about that other people, that other person. As thoughts pass into our mind, it's vital for us to ask ourselves, God revealed to me the truth about this given situation. 
My view is cloudy. My view is foggy. I, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure about this. Sometimes we criticize other people as unfairly. We don't know all their circumstances. We don't know their motives. Only God who knows the entire circumstance is able to judge rightly. Sometime ago I read a story from Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And Stephen Covey was talking about an experience on a train. It was early one morning and it was in New York City. And this gentleman got on the subway. And many other people were on. It was quite quiet and people were reading books and people may have been chatting back and forth, some of them looking at their iPhones and some reading the newspaper. And they stopped at a particular subway stop and a man got on by himself with three children. And the man just sat there, he leaned back in the chair, took a deep breath, whew, kind of closed his eyes, bowed his head, and the kids ran wild. The kids were running up and down the aisle of the subway train. They were yelling, bumping into people that were reading their papers and uh, throwing stuff, their toys at one another. Sometimes they got in a little fight together. And the man just sat there totally oblivious, like nothing was going on. Well, the gentleman sitting next to him was feeling quite irritated about that. And he was thinking to himself, this guy doesn't even take care of his kids. This guy doesn't even discipline those kids. Doesn't he hear them being so noisy and loud? And so he elbowed the guy and he said, hey, look, sir, don't you recognize that your kids are going crazy? They're running up and down the aisles. They're bumping into people. They're knocking the newspapers out of people's hands. Sir, don't you think you'd have, be better, have a better account of your kids? Don't you think you should do something and say something? The man looked up and he said, I am so, so sorry. I guess I was lost in another world for a few moments. You see, we just left the hospital. My kids are in the waiting room. And I went in to see my wife for the last time because my wife just died in the hospital. And I've got to tell my kids and I don't, when we get home, and I, I quite don't know what to say, and I'm, I'm so sorry because I just lost my wife because of cancer. The man who felt irritated looked at this gentleman and said, I am so sorry. His perceptions were changed when he knew the facts. Often the devil will put into our heads negative thoughts about other people because he wants to create barriers. But once we understand what's going on in the lives of other people, it makes all the difference. So the devil can give us thoughts about ourselves that we're not good enough. The devil can give us thoughts about other people. And the devil can give us thoughts about circumstances. The devil often tempts us with thoughts like these. The situation is impossible. Life is so unfair. Why did this happen to me? I don't deserve this. The Apostle Paul could have thought that when he was in prison, couldn't he? He could have thought that when he was being beaten with rods. He could have that, thought that when he was being stoned. He could have thought that when he was shipwrecked and in the sea. When the thought dominates our minds that life has treated us unfairly, it's easy to begin to doubt God's loving intentions for us. And this leads us to become anxious, worried, and fearful. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. 1 John chapter 4. There's something bigger than our circumstances. Something greater than our trials. Something larger than our difficulties. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And what is it? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. And he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If we know that God loves us. If we know that God will never do us any harm. If we know that he's holding us in his hand. And whatever we have to go through, he will strengthen us in Christ. Life's circumstances do not overwhelm us. Because we have one who has cast out all fear of failure. We know that the one who loves us holds us in his hands and in him we are secure. Remember our thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about others, our thoughts about circumstances of life don't always reflect reality. 
Now here is a third principle in keeping your mind. Replace old thoughts with new ones. Now Eastern mysticism says this, find some quiet place to meditate, empty your mind, and come to a quiet place when that mind is empty. That's basically Eastern mysticism. Now Eastern mysticism is not a biblical concept. The truth is the mind can never be emptied, it must be renewed. Did you get that? I don't want you to miss it. The mind can never be emptied. There's always going to be something there, but it can be renewed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, biblical principles to keep your mind when the world is losing its mind. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be renewed. Phillips, J.B. Phillips translation translates Romans 12 to this way. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but renewed. Remember the story that Jesus told of casting out demons from a, from a man? And then he said the house was left empty and seven more demons came back. The devil can fill an empty mind. He can't, he can't fill a filled mind. The devil can fill an empty mind, but he can't fill a full mind. What Jesus is saying is this. If by the grace of God an evil thought is cast out, and you don't replace it with a good thought, seven more evil thoughts are going to come flooding into your mind. Fill your mind with positive thinking, and you'll drive out the evil thoughts. If good things don't fill the empty spaces in our mind, evil things will. All empty spaces are going to be filled with something. Our mind is renewed when we fill it with the word of God day by day as you open the word. Let the word transform your mind and renew your mind. Remember Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10, 15, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And Ellen White in her book, My Life Today, page 25 says, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his minds. The thoughts are brought into captivity. To him we live his life. When we submit ourselves to Christ, our hearts are united with his heart. Our mind is united with his mind and the Holy Spirit enters our life. Now here's the fourth principle. The fourth principle is this. Maybe we should review the first three. What's the first one? Your thoughts follow your focus. Focus your mind on things eternity. What's the second great principle that we studied today? The second great principle is this. Something's always going to fill your mind. Choose to fill your mind with things of eternity. And then we studied the principle about transformation of our minds. You can't empty your mind, but the mind must be brought into captivity to Christ. And then, fourth principle, place a screen on your mind. Now, now my wife and I live in Virginia. There are a few mosquitoes there. And in the summertime, we don't open the windows before we go to bed without screens on them. Why not? Have you ever been in a hotel room where it's been filled with mosquitoes and you've been swatting those things? You know, not long ago, I was in a particular country that will remain unnamed. It was a hot, tropical country. They had little uh, air conditioning in the hotel. And when I walked up the hall to my room, literally, I could see mosquitoes everywhere. And I said, oh, no, this is going to be a tough night. Opened the door to my room. And I, I am not kidding you. There must have been 20, 25 mosquitoes there. So before I went to bed, you know, I took some magazine. And I'm swatting, whap, whap, swatting all these mosquitoes. I think I got about 20 of them, but I didn't get five. Went to bed, bzz, boo, boo. You know, and you're getting up, you're swatting these things. What do you put a screen on your window for? You put it to keep the bugs out. It's not pleasant to be trying to sleep and have mos five mosquitoes buzzing around your head and biting you. Now, God has given us a divine screen for our minds. Here it is, divine screen for the minds. Philippians chapter 4, we looked at that before, and you remember we looked at Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. It talks about the peace of God, 
that surpasses all understanding is going to keep guard or keep your minds. Now, here's the screen. Finally, brethren, sisters. Gives us seven things to evaluate everything that enters our mind. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just. Verse 8. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think upon these things. So let's look at these seven filters in our passage. Finally, brethren, whatever is true. That is true opposed to that which is false. The world promises what it never can deliver. It parades over the screen of our minds through Hollywood falsehood and gets us to think that that falsehood is reality and if we only lived like that we'd have some joy. The promises of God are true. If we fill our mind with that which is false, Hollywood productions, stuff on the internet, if we substitute the false and the artificial for the real and the genuine, we'll only end up having our minds captured by that which we think about most. Eternal truths often have little appeal to the mind filled with falsehood. Fill your mind with that which is true. It says that which is true, that which is honest. A better translation for honest there would be honorable or reverent or worthy. One writer expresses this thought as the dignity of holiness. Fill your mind with, with, with that which is honest, that is which is honorable, that has the dignity of holiness. Is what you're reading, does it have the dignity of holiness? Is what you're watching on television, does it have the dignity of holiness? Is what you're looking at in the internet, does it have the dignity of holiness? See, these are screens for the mind that will help us keep our mind when the world is losing theirs. Whatever is true and honest, whatever is just. Just would be better translated justice. Justice has to do with righteousness or doing what's right, fair, equitable. Ask yourself this question. Is what I'm watching, reading, looking at helping me to, me to treat other people more righteously, more fairly, and more equitably? Then whatever is pure, so clean that it's fit to be brought into the presence of God. I want you to think about that. Is what you're viewing, is what you're listening to, is what you're filling your mind with so pure that it can be brought into the presence of God? Can I bring this activity safely into his presence? Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, that which brings forth love as in kindness, sympathy, and forbearing. Are you watching something that is so gruesome? Are you reading something that is so gruesome? It may be true. But is it lovely? Our minds are like a sponge. And we are shaped by those things that we put into our minds. Whatever is good report. That's something fit for God to hear. It's not ugly, not false, not cheap, not impure. And the last is virtue. Something is virtue. It's excellence. In other words, things that are virtue raise you to be everything that you can be in Christ. Jesus is the divine, all-powerful thought changer. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ changes our carnal hearts and our carnal thoughts to spiritual ones, our selfish thoughts to, to loving, outgoing ones. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus changes our greedy thoughts into giving thoughts, our impure thoughts into pure thoughts, our critical thoughts into caring thoughts. Will you let Jesus... Change your thoughts within. The Apostle Paul says, let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you say, Jesus, I want to focus upon you. I want to focus upon your goodness. Focus upon your grace. Focus upon your mercy. Focus upon your forgiveness. Focus upon your power. Jesus, I don't want to be filled with negative thoughts. I don't want to be filled with my problems, my heartaches, my difficulties, my sorrows. I don't want to be chained in this negative world. I don't want to lose my world to Hollywood and its false artificial joy. I want the deep, abiding, lasting peace that only Christ can give. The deep, abiding, lasting joy that only Christ can give. The deep, abiding, lasting, eternal happiness that only Christ can give. If that is your desire, 
Bow your head with me now as we pray. Father in heaven, you are an almighty God. These brains of ours are amazing with thousands of thoughts rushing into them every minute, with millions of thoughts coming to us each week. And Lord, teach us to focus on the things of eternity. Help us to have the mind of Christ. Help us not to lose our mind to the things of this world when the things of eternity are beckoning. We pray thee as we surrender our lives to you and our thought patterns to you. In Jesus' name, amen.